Hello, hello, COP. Welcome back to our online Sunday service. It's something different, but God is with us. And we're so glad that you were able to join us today for our weekend service. You know, for something a little different, we always read Psalm 91 in the ESV. Today, why don't we read it in the NIV 84? It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord. Do you love the Lord? Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. We are going to worship the Lord together today, as we always do on weekend services. But before that, let me just share with you a verse from Psalm 102. Psalm 102, verse 21 and 22. So the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem when the peoples and the kingdoms assemble to worship the Lord. Assemble. The other translation, ESV, says gather to worship the Lord. When the peoples gather to worship the Lord, the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem when the peoples and the kingdoms gather or assemble. Another word is congregate. So assembly, congregation, gathering. We have similar words. They all mean the same thing. We gather together to worship the Lord. Now in this case, this verse, it has a meaning that is so glorious and is going to be fulfilled, really fulfilled, in the millennial reign when Jesus reigns on this earth for a thousand years. All the nations from everywhere in the world will be coming to Jerusalem to worship. So there's a literal fulfillment of this. But let's take a look at this verse right now for us right now. We were not expecting to have online services, were we? We were expecting to have wonderful in-person services this weekend. But guidelines changed, and we always do follow the guidelines because... It's better for all of us. We stay safe together. But in your house right now, the name of the Lord, everything he is, all that he represents, you know, the name of God represents who he is, his power, his ability, his character. It's all wrapped up in his name. His name can be declared right now in your home if you will all gather together to worship him. Gathering is really important. Of course, it's wonderful when we can gather here in the auditorium and we can worship God. But right now, this weekend, 
we can't yet. So gather together in your home. When we worship God, if someone is off washing the dishes, say, hey, come on over here. Don't wash the dishes now. Right now, we're going to worship the Lord. If someone is off making the beds, say, come on, let's gather first. Let's worship the Lord together. When we worship God together, when we gather ourselves, he is walking among us. His presence is among us. And it's a, it's a promise. And his name, all that he is, all of his power. So if you need healing, reach out to the Lord right now as we gather and worship him. If you need relationship solving, if you need finances, whatever it is you need from God, we are about to worship him gathered together. So whoever is in your household, gather them together right now. Let's open our hearts to the Lord. Let's lift up our hands to him and let's worship him together.
week at COP, come rain or shine, our mighty men in uniform are sharing the gospel on a daily basis. This week, we are rejoicing for 267 military souls saved in military and police camps and stations. This week at COP, amidst rain and slow internet connections, District 4 was able to hold an online with 170 participants and 49 got saved. They have already attended First Truths. This week at COP, District 16 also held an online called In Christ Alone. We're praising God for 57 saved. This week at COP, our Echo Youth Choir, the best youth choir in the whole COP main campus, celebrated 25 years as a ministry with 25 days of online activities, culminating in a great celebration called To Sing His Praise Again. They enjoyed messages from Pastor Jerwill and myself and some much needed fellowship with one another. This week at COP, we rejoice with our brothers and sisters who are dedicating their harvest to the Lord. The Lorico couple dedicated their food business in Project 6 QC and rejoice at the orders already flooding them by dine-in, take-out, and grab online. The Bentir family dedicated their new car to the Lord. The Samonte family dedicated their new car to the Lord. The Radones family dedicated their L300. From COP Davao, the Paniguitan family had a double dedication of the groundbreaking for the new locations of their businesses. The Baino couple dedicated their motorcycle. From South, the Espanol family dedicated their new food business. The Guitaring family dedicated their beautiful home to the Lord. Our very own Abeka director, Teacher Donna, Brother Koi, and their children dedicated this dream home to the Lord that all started with the Altar of Earth. From Isabella, the Abad family dedicated this motorcycle. And finally, also from Isabella, the Kalis family dedicated this already successful hollow block business to the Lord. It has been another great week at COP. Before we turn our attention to the Word today, I want to talk to you a little bit practically. Last week, we were all excited we were only going to be under GCQ, and I was kind of dancing in the office. We get to have church this weekend. We get to have church. And then Friday afternoon, we got surprised, and no, we don't get to have church. Now, brothers and sisters, sometimes life is a roller coaster, but I want you to remember Isaiah 3, verse 10. Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. My great joy is I get to tell you it will be well with you. It will be well with you. You shall eat the fruit of your deeds. You're not going to eat the fruit of COVID-19. You're going to eat the fruit of your deeds. So, beloved, it is going to go well with you. I do have to admit, I kind of sit back and smile. I thought, God, it is amazing how you guide our steps. The last three weeks, all I've been teaching you is on God the provider, that God is a God who provides the provision of God. And that's necessary right now, going into another set of lockdowns, because I know lockdowns really hurt. It hurts your businesses. It hurts your careers. For those of you that are daily wage earners, it just about shuts you down. But we've been learning that our provision doesn't come from this earth. Our provision comes from heaven. God provides for us according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So we've been building our faith, getting ready for this not going to be discouraged by this. And again, I get to tell you, tell the righteous, it will be well with them. So I look at you today and I say, you know what? We're going to get through these next few weeks all right, okay? We're going to get through these next few weeks okay. We're going to get through this COVID thing. It will end, and it will end well for you in Jesus' name. I hear wonderful testimonies. One of our members is sharing with me that they just bought their dream lot. They haven't built the house yet, but they were able to buy their lot, and their family has gone debt-free. So during this COVID thing, they have not only gotten debt-free, but they've been able to buy their lot to build their dream house on. Talked with another one of our drive-ins this morning. She's starting medical school and asked for prayer, and I thought, wow, well, wonderful. These brilliant young people, they're moving on with their lives. These are not the days to give up your dreams. These are the days to see your dreams fulfilled. 
tell the righteous, it will be well with them. Amen. All right, let's turn our attention now to our study, The Cure for Cynicism, Learning the Truth that God Provides. Remember what we've learned about this season that we live in. We live in a world that are the days of evil, and the cares of life have become very heavy and very burdensome. We saw last week that the cares of life bring a heaviness, a dissipation to our hearts, that there's discouragement, there's dismay, there's, there's depression because of the cares of life. But we also saw that Jesus said in the parable of the sower and the seeds that the cares of life choke the word in our lives. Now, I want you to look at two applications of that truth. First of all, truth is choked out of our life. Scripture says your word is truth. Now remember with me what Jesus teaches in Mark 4, verses 24 and 25. He said, pay attention how you listen, because with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And if you don't use it, even what you have will be taken from you. So summing it up, Jesus is saying, you know what? If you don't use truth, you lose truth. Now we often wonder how some of the great doctrines could have been lost through history the great doctrines of salvation by grace, how that could have been lost through history. We wonder how the doctrines that God will provide. We're not talking about avarice and greed here, but that God will provide, that there is a God who will prosper and bless the work of your hands. You wonder how that truth is lost. It's lost in days like this. It's lost in days when your heart is weighted down by the cares of this world. And the cares of this life, the, all the problems and the bills and the difficulties of this COVID-19 thing, it just chokes that truth. It chokes that truth of the Word of God out of your heart. And before long, you, you stop believing that, that God provides. You stop believing that, that God will prosper and bless the work of our hands. You, you, you stop understanding the great, the great truths of blessing and prosperity. So not only is it truth lost, Great doctrines are lost by the the cares of this world choking them out, but faith is lost. If you choke the word, you're also choking faith. There are many of you, and please forgive me, I don't say this rudely, but there are many of you that have believed in prosperity. You believe that God would provide. And in the hard times, you stop believing it. And then you look around one day and you realize, well, why don't I believe that God will provide anymore? And you don't even realize that you stop believing it. It's because the cares of this life have choked the faith out of your heart for God's provision. And so what do we do about it? Well, we <laughs> faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We we pour faith, we we pour the word back into your hearts. And so if you wonder why we work so hard at morning devotions and evening services during this COVID-19 thing. The reason we work so hard to keep pouring the word into you is because we understand the pressures. We understand the cares of life. We understand these things can destroy your life. So we want to keep pouring the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I want us to remember how ancient Christian cynicism and this, this, the, the aesthetics of ancient Christianity, the aesthetics of the first and second century, they all, they all came from these cynics. This, this philosophy that was so strong and before Paul's time and even during Paul's time, as we, we saw earlier, Paul refers to the dogs. Paul refers to the people who practiced asceticism. You know, the, these things were very common and Paul had to deal with it. But the, these, these Christian cynics glorified poverty as a virtue and literally saw prosperity as an evil. And I look around the world today And I see people in Christianity sounding the same as these ancient cynics. They they glorify poverty, even though Proverbs says poverty is the ruin of the poor. And they they see prosperity as evil, even though all provision comes from God. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. Now, these ancient cynics, Christian cynics, used to use very bold speech and insults, and they would hurl them at people in public. They would... Remember what these people were like. We talked about it for several weeks in a row. They'd, they, they, they would dress in total rags. 
their, one of their famous leaders, Diogenes, would actually just wear a clay pot around his waist, hung on by a couple of ropes. They would urinate and defecate in public and then roll it in front of people. But in public, they, would also, they were also very famous for insulting people, just walking up to people and just insulting them. And what they wanted to do was insult people for having nice things. And so they would just walk up and just insult people like barking dogs because they were wearing some nice clothes or they had some nice things. And it's amazing today how in the hard times, you see this even happening in Christianity. You see people insulting people for having nice things. You, you see people angry at people because they're blessed and they're prosperous. And you, you look at the whole thing and you go, man, where did all this come from? I remember in 1980 or 82, around in there, I was teaching the congregation 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we didn't need to work on the first part much because there wasn't anybody among us rich. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. We, we didn't have to talk much about that because <laughs> they called us the blue jean church for a reason. But I always stress that second part. But on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And I remember challenging the members that, you know what, it's all right to have something. That when God blesses you, you don't need to feel condemned about it. You don't need to feel guilty about it. You don't need to, to feel like there's something evil or wrong with you or you've sinned or something and that's why you have something. The, the condemnation that comes against people who, who God blesses is, is absolutely amazing at times. But we see the same thing happening today. And, and we see people who are now pretending to be poor. <laughs> and, and that's one of the funny ones. Proverbs 13, verse 7. One pretends to be rich. We, we get that, okay? We, we get people who are pretending to be rich. Sometimes I call it uh, credit, card, credit card prosperity. They're pretending to be rich, yet has nothing. You know, the, everything they own you see on their body, okay? <laughs> Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Now, why would people pretend to be poor? Now, you know, I've always understood security, all right? People... People drive an old, worn-out car because they don't want to be noticed. People wear older clothes because they don't want to be noticed. They don't, they don't flash because they don't want to be noticed. I, I get that. I, I remember visiting one of our members one time who was quite prosperous, and they had one of the old Toyota Corollas. Remember the old Corollas? And it was a bulletproof Toyota Corolla. And I remember looking at him and laughing and laughing. I said, why would you bulletproof a Toyota Corolla? He said, because I don't want anybody to notice what I'm riding around in. Okay, I get the security part. But there's a new type of people who are pretending to be poor today. And these are what I call the virtue signaling people. They, they want to somehow say that they're identifying with the poor. And they, they want to, to what, what the young people call virtue signaling. They, they want to join in the criticism. They want to join in the mocking of people who are blessed. So they don't want anybody to notice them. So they pretend poverty. Now, I, I look at some of these people and they live in these big, big houses and they want to act like they're poor. They, they want to, we, we just eat street food, but they live in these big mansions. And, and you look at them and you go, why are you pretending? You, you live in these big mansions. Why are you pretending? And why are you criticizing other people's blessings when, forgive me, you have more than they do? It's this ancient doctrine of cynicism coming up again. People are virtue signaling. Now, I want you to understand, no place in Scripture are we taught to be ashamed of the blessings that God has given us. We are to rejoice in the blessings that God has given us. We are to enjoy the blessings that God has given us. And forgive me, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. When somebody walks up to me and shares that they have a new home, or they got a big contract, or they bought a new car, or they're debt-free, that's a cause for my heart to rejoice. I, I don't want to look at those people and say, well, who do you think you are to have such a nice house? Who do you think you are to have such a nice car? Don't you care about the poor? You know, it is amazing to me how people want to act like this today, this virtue signaling. Now, beloved, please don't let people take away the joy of what God has given you. Let me say that again. Please don't let people take away the joy of what God has given you. Let me say that again. 
Please do not let people take away the joy of what God has given you. You are to enjoy. God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And if people are going to not rejoice with your blessings with you, then you know what? Find some new friends, okay? Find some new friends. Now, let me take this a step farther. Ecclesiastes 10, beginning with verse 5. I'm going to read it to you in New Living Translation. It makes it very clear. Solomon says, There is another evil I have seen under the sun. Kings and rulers, these are the people who choose others for positions of, of authority. Kings and rulers make a grave mistake. Now, in our day, it wouldn't be kings and rulers who make the grave mistake. It would be the democratic vote, you know, the democracy, okay? People choosing leaders. So the people who choose leadership, choose positions of authority, make a grave mistake. When they give great authority to foolish people and low positions to people of proven worth, he said, I've even seen servants riding horseback like princes and princes walking like servants. Ah, here's that poverty mentality. Let's give everybody a chance. Let's have equity. Let's, let's do all of this woke stuff. And they, they, they give great authority to foolish people and people who have proven worth, they put in low positions. Fascinating. Fascinating. And servants, poor, riding on the horseback like princes, and the princes walking like servants. Now, now, now beloved, this whole Robin Hood mentality, this, this whole thing that's sweeping the world right now, and, and one day it will give to our beloved country, where people feel they have the right to take away what belongs to others who have worked for it, because, you know, we want, we want equity. You know what? There is no equity in this world except at the foot of the cross. God is a God who gives everyone equal opportunity. God does not show favoritism. I'm going to get more into this next week. But I want you to begin to see this, this grievous evil, as Solomon says, that, that's taking place in the world. And, and forgive me, he lived in the wealthiest time of Israel's history. Okay, He lived in the wealthiest time of Israel's history. But evidently, there was a mentality that was going through society, even in his day, with all of the wealth and blessings. Now, think about these things. Now, in the last few weeks, we've talked together about the history of poverty and prosperity, that God created a prosperous place for Adam and Eve. Poverty came to this world because of sin. Poverty is authored by sin. Prosperity is authored by God. We learn that poverty is the ruin of the poor, Proverbs 10, verse 15. Poverty is not a virtue. Poverty is the ruin of the poor. Poverty destroys people. You've got no money for the dentist. You've got, not, you've got no money for, for medicines. You've got no money for vitamins and good, decent food to eat. You've got no money for, for clothes. You've got no money for proper shelter. It destroys the physical body. Poverty is not a virtue. It's the ruin of the poor. In our last study, we learned that God has always been the provider of all creation, and especially for his people. I want to pick up today and take a very, very simple story of Jesus. One of the beautiful stories of Jesus is provision. And I want you to learn some beautiful truth from it. First of all, why does God provide? Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 2. Jesus said, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. So why does God provide? Compassion. He, 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 he provides because he's affected by our needs. He provides because he cares. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses. He understands. He understands hunger. He understands thirst. He understands need. And he has compassion. Now, this is a revelation every one of us needs to get into. Do you remember the leper in Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 40? The leper came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you're willing, and the Greek word for willing there means, do you have a desire based on an emotion that you feel when you look at me? 
And Jesus said, yes, I am willing. I do have a desire to heal you, not because it's just the right thing to do, but because I feel something when I look at you. That leper understood something important. God cares. That leper understood something important. God feels. Now, single moms, listen to me. You think God doesn't care? You think God's heart is not moved when you lay on your bed at night and tears are coming down your eyes onto your pillow because you can't figure out how to get food for your kids tomorrow? You think God looks at that and doesn't feel something? Excuse me. That's not our God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has compassion on you. Moms and dads, you... You sit there and you look at your kids and you can't enroll them in college because there's no money and the kids are crying because they're going to get behind their classmates, they're going to get behind their friends. You, you think God doesn't look upon that? You think God doesn't feel anything when he sees that? You think God doesn't feel something when he sees your stomach in a knot every time the phone rings because it's a bill collector? You think God doesn't feel something when he, you think about, well, they're going to come and turn off my electricity tomorrow? You, you think God doesn't feel something? When God looks at a family in need, he has compassion. When God looks at a single mom or a single dad in need, he has compassion. Now, beloved, you've got to get a hold of this. You, you've got to get a hold of this truth that your heavenly Father doesn't sit back and like a stone-cold heart and not care. That's not your God. That's not your Father. He looks upon you with compassion. But too often we stop there, but there's more in these verses. He said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far off. So not only did he provide because of compassion, he provided because he understands sometimes life happens. Now, these people, no doubt, when they came out, and some of them had traveled a long way, when they left, they had plenty of food. They had thought ahead. They had planned. These were not foolish, stupid people. They had brought food. They had brought water. They had come prepared. But some of them had traveled a very long way because Jesus had kept moving. And now for three days they'd stayed with him. Now, when, when you look at the three days and you look at the long distance, you realize Jesus understands sometimes life happens. These people didn't do anything wrong. These people didn't make a mistake. These people were being faithful. Now think of that. These people did not make a mistake. They were being faithful. They were staying there with him even though they knew they were running out of food because they wanted to be with him. These weren't the rejectors of Jesus. These were the people who loved him. And they stayed with him. So they weren't making a mistake. They weren't doing something wrong. They, they weren't in trouble because they'd been foolish or stupid. They were in trouble come sometimes because life happens. And Jesus said, I'm not going to take advantage of this faithfulness. They've been with me for three days. And I also recognize that there are physical limitations. If, if they go off walking and they're hungry, and it's going to take them a few days to get home before they can get some food, they might faint on the way. They might pass out on the way because they, they need food. So Jesus cared about the physical needs that were created by life happening. Now, beloved, some of you are in challenges right now in this COVID-19 thing. Not because you've done something wrong. Not because you've been foolish, not because you've been stupid, not because you've made a mistake, not because you've sinned, but just because life happened. And you've been being faithful to God in this whole time, and then life happened. So why does God provide? <laughs> because he has compassion. And because sometimes life happens. But now move on a little bit farther. Beginning with verse 5. How does God provide? He says, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. Now, here's a great truth you've got to get a hold of. We always think that God is going to provide something out of nowhere. But it doesn't work like that. God always asks, what do you have? What do you have in your hand? 
a miracle of provision, especially a miracle of multiplication that we're talking about here, always begins with something that you already have. It might be a piece of property. Psalms chapter 85, verse 12. Yes, the Lord will give what is good. Our land will yield its increase. Our land is something God already gave us, but it's going to yield its increase. Maybe it's a business that you have, and God is going to all of a sudden touch it, and it's going to yield its increase. Maybe it's a job that you've had for several years, and you haven't made much money, but all of a sudden, God's going to touch that job he gave you. And now all of a sudden, there's going to be a promotion. There's going to be a salary increase. There's going to be a, uh, an extra bonus. All of a sudden, that job is going to yield its increase. It's something that you already have. Uh, for Peter, it was an ability to fish. Matthew 17, verse 27, they, they had a need, and Jesus said, go cast a, a hook into the water and catch a fish. It's something that Peter already knew how to do. It may be a long-term asset that God is going to change the nature of. Now, I taught you this last week, Ezekiel 34, beginning with verse 29. And I will provide for them renowned plantations, ESV, NLT. I will make their land famous for its crops. All of a sudden, God will take a little canteen location and make it famous for what it produces. All of a sudden, God will take an ice cream stand or a little bake shop, and all of a sudden, it becomes a bake shop famous. All of a sudden, it becomes what businessmen call a cash cow. All of a sudden, something that you already have, a business that you already have, a, a piece of property that you already have, an ability that you already have, a, a job that you already have, all of a sudden, something that you have is going to get touched with the supernatural. All of a sudden, boom, and you're going to go, whoa. And all of a sudden, something that was just sitting there, almost lifeless, all of a sudden, there's a huge blessing flowing. Now think with me of other famous Bible examples. The widow's jar of oil in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Uh, she said to Elisha, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. She saw little value in it. <laughs> God loves to take the things that you and I see little value in and just make them explode. The next thing you know, that little jar of oil filled up all these great big pots of oil. And all of a sudden, all of the debts were paid, and there was an abundance left for her and her, her children to live on. But it started with something that she saw as insignificant. What in your life are you just, forgive me, despising or thinking little of? You, you look at it and you think it's, it's not relevant. That's what God will multiply. You, you think with the widow with Elijah in 1 Kings 17, verses 10 to 12, she said, all I have is a little flour and a little oil. I'm going to bake bread and die. Little did she know that that little that she had was about to get multiplied every single day. <laughs> I love it. Now, here's my question for you. What little insignificant thing is in your life that you look at as meaningless? May God open your eyes. May God open your understanding. To see that something that you have is what he's going to bring great blessing to you with. But now, in addition to starting with something that's already in our hands, this miracle of multiplication follows thanksgiving. Now look at verse 6. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them. The multiplication did not come until after thanksgiving. And having given thanks... He broke them. Now, beloved, if you're going to look at the little thing that you have, and you're going to have a bad attitude, well, why do they have more than I do? <laughs> you're going to have that bad attitude of envy, and you're going to have that bad attitude of jealousy. You're going to keep thinking, well, I just have a little. This little, blah. If you're going to have an attitude like that, there's not going to be a miracle of multiplication. I'm sorry. Sometimes you look at that little that you have, and you start being thankful for it. And you give God thanks for it. God, I may not have much, but I'm, I'm thankful for this little that I have. And when you're thankful, after you give thanks, that's when the miracle of multiplication 
starts. Now, I've always taught you that Thanksgiving releases miracles. I mean, think with me from the, the healing of the, the ten lepers in Luke chapter 17, verses 14 and 19. They all went away. One man came back and said, thank you. Remember? One man came back and said, thank you. And then verse 19 says, go. Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you whole. All the other lepers got healed of leprosy. The scars were there. The the fingers, the digits of their fingers had come off. Their noses that had come off. Now, the leprosy was gone, but they were scarred. I I was listening to a man the other day, and he kept talking about there are going to be scars in the economy when COVID is done. There's going to be scars in businesses. There's going to be scars in family finances. (laughs) And I thought, oh, we need the miracle of the leper. There were no scars left. When he came back and said, thank you, he was made whole. He got the digits back on his finger. He got his nose back. He got his ears back. He got the the skin back. He was made whole. So there's a difference between healing and made whole. Healing, there'll be some scars. Made whole, everything is back to the way it was before. In the same way, beloved, There's not going to be any scars left on your businesses. There's not going to be scars left on your finances. There's not going to be scars left in the economy of your family. If you come back and say thank you, he will make things whole. Amen? So be thankful. Whatever little thing it is, be thankful. (laughs) Now, when the miracle of multiplication takes place, verses 6 to 7, it happened in an orderly fashion. I'm running out of time. It happened in an orderly fashion. He, he said it before the people. It happened in abundance. But now, uh, it happens in abundance, but it's not endless. Now, notice with me. Mark 8, verse 8. They ate and were satisfied and took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. So, all right. There's abundance. Everybody ate until they were full. The miracle of multiplication meets all of the need, and there's an abundance left over, all right? But it's not endless. The the, the bread and the, the fish did not just keep multiplying forever and ever and ever. When the need was met with abundance, then the miracle stopped. There came a day that the miracle stopped for the woman, the widow at Zarephath. There came a point when the oil stopped pouring for the woman, for the widow woman with the the oil that wouldn't run dry. There came a point. So again, the principle is this. The miracle of multiplication will happen in abundance, but it's not endless. And there are some people, when they see a miracle of multiplication taking place, they change their lifestyle standards. They, they, they change a lot of things that they shouldn't change because they think this is going to go on forever. And it's not going to go on forever. It's going to meet the need, and it's going to give you the seven basketfuls left over, and then it's going to stop. Miracles of multiplication occur with abundance, but they are not endless. Now, what do you do with the abundance? Verse 8, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven basketfuls. They gathered up the extra food. Never waste the abundance of a miracle of multiplication. Never just go crazy. You know, there are some people, the bills are paid, and they've got some extra money, and they just go blow it. You know, they just say, well, I want to take a trip. It's been a hard year. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. No, no, no. When God, when God meets the need and gives you an abundance left over, don't go blow it. Gather up the leftover. Put it in the bank. Be careful with that. Let me say that again. Be careful. Be a good steward with the abundance. Don't go crazy extravagant. Be a good steward with the abundance in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to pray for you today. I also want to talk straight up to some of you, especially our Connect Group leaders. If we've got members that are are hurting, then we want to make sure that they're taken care of. So if if you're one of our members, and in these next few weeks, food runs out. We know that the government doesn't have any more money to pass out food. Food runs out. We have food pre-positioned in all of our major campuses. Contact your district pastor. You know who he is That's or who she is. They're the ones that call you all the time to check on you. Get in touch with your district pastor. Get in touch with your campus pastor. And we'll have food pre-positioned in those areas to make sure our families have food. Amen? But in the meantime, use your faith for that multiplication. Don't give up your dreams, beloved. This is the wealth of the wicked 
is laid up for the righteous. Wealth does not transfer in the good times. Everybody makes money in the good times. Wealth transfers in the hard times. Go back to the Joseph principle. You should not be giving up your dreams. You should be looking for your dream house. You should be looking for that piece of property that you've always wanted to buy. You should be looking, some of you, some of you have dreams of a farm. Now, I have to tell you, it's never been my dream to have a farm. But some of you have had dreams of a farm. This is going to be the time to do that. This is the time. Don't give up on your dreams in these days. Father, I lift you, your sons and daughters. We're walking into, <laughs> we don't know how long, Lord. They've told us two weeks in the past, and it's gone for three months. Father, we ask in Jesus' name for a special grace for miracles of multiplication. Multiplication of sales, multiplication of business, multiplication of salaries. Father, we ask for miracles of multiplication. And Father, let your people see your provision in their lives. In Jesus' name. Now remember, Fortress 91 and all of our campuses, except on Monday, Monday the pastors take off. Please don't come with a large group, okay? Just your family come or by yourself. And don't be shy about wanting to take extra communion home to your family, to the seniors and things. You know, if the seniors and your young people can't get out, take some communion home and have communion together as a family. I mean, we have our own communion manufacturing machine now, all right? So it's, it's really cool. So, But when you take them home, keep them in the refrigerator. Remember, it's fresh orange juice, okay? And it's going to spoil if you leave it out in the sun, so keep it in the refrigerator. And then as a family, celebrate together, all right? So... Come to any of our Fortress 91s and any of our campuses. Just say, I'd like to take some extra home for the family. Now, don't take them for the barangay, okay, because they do still cost money. But, but for our, our families, take them home for the family and celebrate communion and remember what Jesus has done for your family. Amen? All right, we'll see you during Fortress 91.